Hi, I'm Elise Hogue, um, and uh, I, I like to speak in public. I was once um, teased a lot for getting drunk and grabbing the mic and saying, I like the mic, and the mic likes me. <laughs> and um, this is, there are people in this room that were probably there and remember that. Um, this, is, uh, this, is, I, this is probably the hardest speech that I've ever given in public, and I keep hearing Becky say to me, just keep it real. So I'm going to try and keep it real. So if you guys will be forgiving, if I flub a word here or there, then I'm going to do my best to not use my notes and just talk a little bit. One of the things um, that's been hard since getting the news is being away. After 10 years in San Francisco, I live in DC now. And um, when something like this happens, you realize how genuine our tribe is, our family is, the Rand family, and everybody that's touched by the Rand family. And Becky was at the epicenter of that family. And flying home last night felt like being embraced by my tribe. And I'm, I'm grateful for that, even though it feels so very, very wrong for Becky not to be here. When I left RAN eight years ago, I gave Mike Brune three months notice, which was a lot. It was a lot of time to replace my position, get someone else in, maybe have some overlap, knowledge transfer. Um, the time ticked away. Nobody emerged to take the global finance campaign to the next level. I left. I started my new life. Three more months elapsed, and I started to actually get a little pissed. I was like, there's a lot of work to be done. I left a lot of work to be done. What's taking so long? Well, when I heard the news that the fabulous Becky Tarbotten was taking my job, all of my questions were answered. I've heard a lot of the first time I met Becky stories in the last couple days, and, and here's mine. Um, my house here is called the House of York. Probably half the room, if not more, has been to parties there. I first met Becky at a party at the House of York, and she showed up, and I think she'd been at another party, and it was a costume party. And like Jessica said, she was wearing this silver spandex thing. That was kind of awesome, but it made my 12-year-old godson and all of his friends pretty much fall on the floor. And I'm pretty convinced that there's a whole generation of young men from the mission who now compare every girlfriend they have to that image of Becky in her silver spandex suit. <laughs> but although her physical beauty was striking, what those boys were reacting to, and I've seen so many people react to since then, is that sense that when Becky walked into the room, the lights burned at a higher wattage. It was such an intense phenomena that I watched people want to get physically closer to Becky when she was in the room, as though if they were in her proximity, that radiant life force that came out of her would make them burn brighter as well. This was a quality that served her incredibly well once she started at RAN. Being a leader is hard. Being a woman leader is even harder sometimes. And being a woman leader in the male-dominated environmental movement is a real challenge. The macho energy that drives us to take that wildness and channel it into more courageous and bolder acts, that's one of the most joyful and vexing parts of the work. You have to be able to hang late into the night, joking with the guys, and even drinking some whiskey with them once in a while, while still maintaining that grace and femininity. This was just never a problem for Becky. She wore it like her second nature. And I think it's, people have said this a lot, but I really think it's because although Becky never ever underestimated the seriousness of her mission on Earth, she never took herself too seriously. She navigated Rand retreats and Wall Street boardrooms with a grace and a joy in a world that was defined by fierce confrontation. And in doing so, what she showed was that successes, her successes in winning over people and winning campaigns, proved that we can have victories while leading with joy. Becky's effectiveness in life and in work 
lay in her total and complete authenticity in everything she did. I never once saw Becky be anything other than Becky. And like Mateo said, there were a lot of Beckys. There was the Becky that was sometimes pretending to be braver than she was when she broke the stuffy rules at the high-level State Department meeting and walked straight up to the corporate targets of RAN and told them what was what. There was the goofy Becky, or as Jessica called it, the clumsy Becky, who fell off her clogs at the W in DC, where I promise you, people don't even wear clogs, much <laughs> less fall off of them. Right, Tracy? <laughs> Sometimes, she often, always actually, she was the deeply empathetic Becky. As she was when she passed me a postcard with her favorite Mary Oliver poem, when I was so burnt out, I was seriously questioning whether I could continue to do the kind of work that we all do. And I know all of you have that moment, or that postcard, or whatever it is that Becky handed you. I have to say that while Becky followed me at RAN, I followed her a lot after that. We shared a cabin in Sonoma in 2010, immediately after she and Mateo moved into their new apartment. We stayed up late into the night, and while she was so excited to be on this trip, a part of her was so excited for your future together that she was with you, Mateo. And I don't have to tell you how much she loved you because you lived it. But what I can tell you is those late nights that we stayed up, I bore witness to the courageous way that she leapt into that love. And it helped me embrace my unfolding love with my partner. And we decided to get married shortly after you all did, listening to and watching the beauty of your commitment to one another. Becky's wisdom flowed through her effortlessly and with a beauty so rich, it was almost audible. And I mean that, audible. When I think of Becky, I think of sounds. I think of two sounds. I think of her playing her fiddle, insisting she wasn't very good. She would pick up a wood, piece of wood with strings and play melodies so sweet that it made you want to laugh and cry simultaneously. And I think of Becky's laugh, whether she was laughing with delight at some new joke she had just made up or some treasure she had found or whether she was laughing at herself for some perceived flub. Becky's laugh was the stuff of champagne on a sunny day in the arms of the tribe you love the most. That laugh reminds us to live the best damn lives we can muster. Becky gave me a card last year, and on the front it read, live what you love and love what you do, there are hundreds of ways to kneel and kiss the earth. Our charge is to figure out our way to kneel and kiss the earth. And when we do, we'll hear Becky laughing along with us.